Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for From Idea to Hired, talking about everything uh, you need to know to find a literary agent, how um, projects go from, from book to film, uh, and how to find one of these uh, magical creatures called uh, literary agents. My name is Nathan Bransford. Uh, I used to be a literary agent. Uh, I am no more, but I'm an author. I wrote the Jacob Wunderbar series and how to write a novel, and I run a blog at NathanBransford.com on everything you know, need to know to find publication. Uh, so I have four lovely agents with me today. Uh, we'll start off with introductions. Uh, Lars, since you're in my top left corner, sure. I wonder if we could start with you. Yeah, so uh, my name's Lars Terrio. I actually, I was an agent for 20 years at a company called ICM. I represented screenwriters and directors, but I also had a pretty big side business in comic books, um, representing comic book creators and a couple of comic book companies, which I think is how I wound up on this panel in the first place. But um, so my expertise is in screenwriting um, and then in selling comic books to, um, to film and television. Great. Holly, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Holly Root, and I am a literary agent and also the owner of Root Literary, um, the very creatively named literary agency based out here in Los Angeles. Um, and then we also have some agents working in New York City. Um, and I represent authors of commercial fiction for kids and adults and the occasional dabble into the nonfiction side of things. Great. Uh, Carissa? Hi, my name is Kirisa Robinson. Um, I'm a literary agent at Nelson Literary, which is based in Denver, but I am in New York City. Um, I represent uh, middle grade YA and adult. Um, and in the adult space, it's primarily science fiction and fantasy and a little bit of romance. Great, and Dong Wan. Hi, I'm Dong Wan Song. Uh, I'm a literary agent with the Howard Morheim Literary Agency. Uh, I do almost all commercial fiction, science fiction, fantasy, horror for adults. Uh, I also do young adult middle grade, uh, some contemporary and some speculative there, and some graphic novels as well. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to start off with a, with a big general topic, uh, just to give everyone kind of a, who are familiar with the process an overview of how this all works. So. Uh, what do literary agents do? How does a project go from uh, from an idea to, to an actual book? Does one of you want to take off uh, that one big topic? I feel like it's such a big topic that probably all of us could take it on <laughs> and yeah. answer slightly differently. You want to take different pieces, um, yeah. <laughs> I'll kick it off with um, we're we're in a really lucky position as agents or managers um, in that we're the people there with the creator from the very early stages of bringing an idea to life. Um, when somebody comes to us new as a brand new client, they've usually already finished a book, um, but that's just the beginning of what's hopefully a very long running relationship where we see projects through both from that sort of first novel that we might get in from a slush submission, a query letter that comes in over the transom. Um, but then we go alongside that author as they do every project that follows. So from that very first book that they, you know, wrote maybe in the morning before heading off to work or before kids got up or whatever, um, all the way through to coming up with what we're going to follow up their huge beloved successful trilogy with, like what's your next act? Um, agents and managers are right there alongside the creator the whole way. Awesome. So once you guys take on a project, how do you, what do you do next? You, you shop it to, to publishers to try and get a book deal. Does, does one of you want to take on how, how that process works and how you go about submitting a book project to get it published? Yeah, for me, there's usually um, some prep before that happens, right? Um, I tend to be a bit very editorial agent. I used to be an editor of Big Five House as well. So, you know, I tend to work with clients to make sure the project is exactly where we want it to be when, for it to go out to publishers. Um, so there's some editorial, there's some work like that. And then, yeah, it's putting together the pitch. It's figuring out how do we want to talk about this book? What's a compelling way we can send a message to a publisher that they'll get excited about it. They can communicate, the editors can take that to their bosses and really get everyone in-house on board for a project. Um, so, you know, I think there is that pre-submission phase in terms of getting all your ducks in a row, figuring out, you know, what's the best way to talk about this and making sure that the manuscript is really reflecting the narrative that you're trying to build there. 
Awesome. So when, when projects come to you, what is it, what is it that you look for? Uh, how do you know when you have something that you like or that you're, you're definitely want to take on? Well, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Well, when I am taking on a project, it has to be way more than like, um, it has to be like deep, passionate love. Um, I have to have a vision for it. I have to have no like, the editorial direction I want to go to through with it because um, I was also a former editor so I'm a very editorial agent um, have to know what people I want to submit it to so if all those things are clicking while I'm reading it and I'm falling in love and the writing is great and the story is great then that's like the perfect storm to make you want to take on a new client and just to jump in with another little thing, you know, kind of building off of something that Holly was talking about earlier, you know, we're not in it just for one project, right? We're, we're usually trying to build a career. So for me, a lot of it comes down to uh, not just do I love this particular book, but do I think this person has what it takes to write future projects and keep building on that career, right? So you have to love that first book, like Caressa is talking about, but like, it also is, um, you know, I talk about how I, I sign people, not projects sometimes. Um, and so it's kind of, it, there's a lot of factors that go into that decision that I think let us view things more holistically as well. Yeah, it's funny. I was just talking with somebody about this, that there was an author who had come across my desk and I loved a previous book and the new direction I was like oh I see it I understand what that is but I don't get it viscerally in that same way um, and so sometimes I know when people are looking for an agent it can be hard to hear like I don't have the vision or you know I'm not sure that I get it but the worst thing to me would be to to offer representation to somebody and then thwart them <laughs> <laughs> to come yeah. at them with an idea that's not actually where they want to go or who they want to be as a creator. And so I think that's why that connection and that passion, these, the, the buzzwords can sound so sort of like, oh, well, please let me prepare you the perfect, you know, meal for your specific enjoyment. But it really is part of how we serve our clients well to be passionate advocates who can, who can support and be the rocket fuel um, to get them where they want to go. Yeah, you know, sometimes when I answer this question, it can generate a lot of frustration because I think a lot of times people are looking for a roadmap and it's hard, it's hard to deliver one because so much of the response to material is just visceral, right? Like, you know, my biggest client, I can still remember 15 years ago reading a script that he wrote on the couch next to my wife and saying, and elbowing her in the ribs every 30 seconds, like, you got to hear this, you got to hear this, you got to hear this, right? And like, that's how you know you're really rolling on something. And, and, and there's no way, I can't tell you, how to write something that'll make me do that to my wife, right? So it's, it's complicated, but you know, you know, in addition to all the things we're all saying about seeing the vision and knowing who you want to send it to, there's a visceral, oh my God, I, I can't wait to talk to people about this. That's sort of hard to, hard to put into words about how, you know, and give people a roadmap of how to get there. And how much does the market factor into that sort of visceral feeling? I mean, do you, uh, how specific do you get as you think about, well, I might love this, voice or I might love this book, but I'm just not sure about the market. How do you begin to think through those kinds of considerations? I mean, it, there's a couple, there's two things for me. There's the, there's the, this person is super talented and I want to work with them. I'm, you know, we'll figure that out. And then there's the, can I sell this particular thing? Um, and sometimes the answer is no. You know, I've had, I've had clients write, tell me they wanted to write things. And I, and I said, look, commercially, that's a very tar small target to hit. It's going to be very hard to sell. Um, but if you're feeling it, if it's coming out of you, we'll do something with it. And I've had weird scripts that I didn't, you know, that I didn't think that I could sell that I in fact did not sell, but that were so crazy or so interesting or so funny or so scary that they sort of went viral in the old fashioned way of one executive sending it to another, sending it to another, you got to read this, you got to read this. And now those writers are working, even though that script that they wrote or book never sold. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's elements that have nothing to do with whether or not I can sell it. It's, is this person, insanely talented and are they going to make a dent in in a loud marketplace yeah i personally found that i've sort of had to shut that that will this work in the market voice off every time i've thought i've had sort of a center of market slam dunk this is an obvious success it's been an unmitigated disaster for me so right. you know I, for and then on the flip side whenever not whenever but there have been times where i've had a project that is so strange or so offbeat that i've been like i love this book i love this voice i have no idea how to sell it 
Um, those are the ones that, that get traction or, you know, you do end up finding a home for that book. Um, sometimes it just takes time to stick with it. I had an editor call me two years after I sent it out and was just like, I can't stop thinking about this book, even though I passed on it. Can we do this now? And, you know, it was just such like a fun, lovely sort of end to that story or, you know, beginning of a new story at least. Um, so, you know, there are big considerations of this doesn't, this isn't publishable or this, the, the, the market just isn't there for this type of thing. But when it comes to something more specific, I tend to trust my instincts and, and follow my, my love for a book over my thoughts of, oh, this is going to work or, or this, is, this is an obvious success. I, I sold a 15 year old script that way six months ago. It was so, <laughs> somebody, cause, somebody calling <laughs> wow. me and saying, whatever happened to that script? I loved it so much. And we sold wow. it. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah, I think for me, the um, the market considerations can be a tipping point. So if I'm sort of like, Ugh, something here, there's something here, um, but I'm having a hard time kind of figuring out like why I'm not a full on yes. Um, one of my old bosses used to say, if it's a maybe, it's a no, which is just like the worst, yeah. um, but is honestly true. Um, because you do, you kind of have to have that clarity about, okay, yes, I know that it's hard when you find something you love, even if it's the most saturated thing that publishing has going on right now, when you love it, you're like, I don't care. I'll fight anyway. And that's kind of what you have to have. So sometimes I will find that it will knock me off of something. Um, but I'm at this point in my career, I'm working a lot with sort of my existing roster. And one of the things that comes up with those guys is sort of like pre-planning. Okay, so you're thinking about doing this. It's a really ca crowded category. Here's what we could maybe do to address some of that. Um, and I find too that for authors sort of at the beginning, um, when they're really super well-read in their categories, you will sometimes see that even though something might feel oh, maybe that's a little crowded, uh, you can feel them subverting the expectations in a really fun way. So sometimes there's an opportunity even in a really crowded category. Yeah, for me, um, it's mainly about the particular author um, because I'm looking for someone who I can be with for their entire career. So even if I love the writing, but maybe I have a clear picture of how I could potentially sell this book, but it doesn't sell, then I know that that writer is prolific and they can come up with another idea. Or we think about other ideas when we go on submission um, that I, we kind of workshop out and they choose one that they work on. Um, and so if it's not the first book, it's not the second, it's not the third, the fourth, fifth, however long it takes. But I know that they are talented enough that one day it will get there. It's interesting to hear you guys talk about it. I mean, just how much goes into just sort of personal resonance and um, and then the market really being being secondary to that. And I, I hope the authors find that kind of empowering in a way that either that the, you guys aren't a bunch of mercenaries who are just uh, you know looking to strike a, a quick buck. Um, so you know, there used to be like two ways that that authors found agents. Roughly, I mean, you kind of either had to know someone or get a referral, or you write the dreaded query letter, which for those who don't know is a letter describing a project and, and, um, and to a literary agent. Now there's a lot of, lot more avenues uh, with, with pitch wars and hashtags and, um, and you know, a lot of agents going to conferences to try and find people. Um, how are you finding clients these days and has that changed at all or do you still kind of uh, mostly go by the tried and true processes of reading slush piles and things like that? Um, it's kind of all of the above for me. Um, so I have three clients who were in pitch wars. Um, I have a, one who was from DB Pit, um, but the majority of them actually do come from unsolicited queries. Yeah, I have, um, I, we've never officially participated in pitch wars like as a, an official entity. Um, but the funny thing to me is, and I think this does, hopefully this gives people hope, um, several times I've gone after things where I requested it from a query before the DV pit, or not DV pit, um, the pitch wars window sort of went up. Um, and then I couldn't get 
the manuscript because they they're not allowed to be on submission while they're doing the revisions or something I don't understand all the intricacies intricacies but it's a funny thing and then you watch you know they get all these likes and then you're like but I requested that back in November <laughs> um so that it listen don't cry for me it's fine but um <laughs> <laughs> but like it, it is proof that as much as those contests can really elevate things or, you know, especially if you have a really pitchable concept, um, slush does still work. And I do think even without, even before all of that, you know, they, we, those were projects I responded to even before they had that extra spotlight on them. I can't count the number of times I've requested something on DV Pit, and they'll reply and be like, um, I sent that to you last week. It's in your inbox. And I'm like, oh, I just <laughs> haven't gone through my queries this week, you know? Yeah, um, I've done that, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, I've only really picked up one client through, I think it was Pit Mad, and it was a case where it was someone who I thought was really interesting, but I just had never worked in the genre that she works in. And, you know, it was like a YA contemporary romance. And so when I liked her tweet, and I just sort of did it almost on a whim, because I liked her and the, the pitch sounded great. She was like, wait, do you do you really want this? Do you even work on these kind of books? Um, so, you know, I think the Twitter contest can really provide opportunities to, to sort of spread a little bit and, and work outside of your comfort zones. Uh, but, you know, if you're working inside a space that you're really well established in, you already have so many channels that are bringing those books to you. Um, that said, I think Twitter pitch contests are great and they certainly don't harm anything. And um, I think they can be really great opportunities, especially for marginalized writers. So. And what catches your eye in, in these pitches? Um, you know, we talk a bit about sort of authors holistically and manuscripts and things like that, but are there things that, particularly things that an author can do to catch, catch an eye as they're, your eye as they're pitching um, and things that really jump out at you? I think, I mean, I, I feel like I say this every year, but like so many pitches forget to make you want to read the book. They tell you about like the back, like the, the, you know, intricacies of it, but they like forget that the point is to make you want to read it. Um, and so it's never bad if you're writing queries to just spend a little time looking at, you know, some of your favorite books, like books that it worked on you. Like if you were successfully sold by that, by that copy, then look at that and use it as a model. So a lot of, um, you know, a lot of authors share their pitches that worked online now too. So it's never bad to sort of, you know, put a favorite author name and the word query into Google and see if anything comes back, especially if your faves are, you know, extremely online. Um, if your faves are more of the like, you know, yurt hermit style probably will not get any results there but um but a lot of people have been really generous in sharing that and i feel like seeing good examples can be one of the best ways to really nail that selling copy and it's hard to talk about your own stuff that way so we're, we're sympathetic like we want you to be good um so just you know persuasive solid writing is really the the secret yeah, I always tell people that, you know, pitching is a skill and like any skill, it's learnable and trainable. Um, so, you know, I, I encourage people to start practicing early um, and start practicing pitches for their books. But also the trick I tell people is you can pitch other people's books, you can pitch other things that you watch, and that's a great way to learn the skills, right? So anytime you read a book, anytime you watch a movie, just try and convince someone in your life to read that book, watch that movie, and sort of you'll learn the rhythms and the skills of what works and what catches people's attention and what doesn't if you're doing it really deliberately and attentively as you talk about it. So, Yeah, I, I don't know if I say this every year, but I definitely say it often. Um, I, I always, I've encouraged people to take acting classes because, and, and look, what I do is a little bit differently, right? I'm not a, I'm not a traditional book agent. I, I represent a lot of screenwriters and and one big aspect of what the people that I represent do is they need to be good in a room. And, um, and being good in a room is basically pitching. You're pitching yourself, you're pitching a project, whatever. So um, it is learnable, you're right. Um, it is something you can train yourself to do, um, but not everyone has the, you know, the personality for it. There, there are lots of writers in Hollywood who are super talented, who mainly sell things that are original because they're not great in a room. Um, but that, but you know, that can be learned. And so the, you know, one of the things I always throw out there is, you know, go take an acting class. If you're uncomfortable in front of a bunch of people you don't know, you're going to be really super uncomfortable in front of a studio head when you have to pitch him a movie. So, you know, that's, that's something you got to sort of get over because you're going to be pitching yourself for the rest of your life if you want to be a writer. What are some of the things uh, authors shouldn't do? What are the What are some of the things that um, that where projects can go astray or sink a project? Uh, anyone want want to talk about any pitching pet peeves or 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 don'ts? 
Um, Don't be rude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Don't disparage other books in the genre, or just don't disparage books in general. Yeah, that's that's a hard one, and I feel like that is an instinct. I mean, I had to train out of myself that you can praise something without putting something else down, um, because you never know, you know, what maybe it's not on my list, but it might be a book I really loved and admired. <laughs> and I think you can highlight the things that your book is doing without diminishing the work of others. Um, and I think especially, you know, I think we both work in um, romance. And so you, you, sometimes you get queries that really put down romance or um, fantasy or YA or whatever it is. Um, I have made my bones on, you know, books that people like to look down on. Um, so you do sometimes see that happen. Um, but most of the, I mean, most of the time the, the, the bad queries are really outrageous has been my experience like they go all in like they are at 11 like you're gonna insult your mom your work where you live like everything it's top to bottom just it's aggressive um, six months later they're the, still emailing you yeah i mean maybe it, it's pretty crazy um but the yeah but i think for most of the most people are really trying hard and i think i, I certainly i will overlook a lot of just sort of rookie mistakes or nerves um, because I know how hard it is and I know how scary it is to put your work out there. So uh, a lot is happening in 2020. Uh, you know, we are not in a room together at Comic-Con. We are in our respective um, apartments and backyards as, uh, <laughs> as the case may be. Um, so uh, what, how is 2020 a affecting publishing we'll get to hollywood in a second but let's start with publishing like how is the events of 2020 between the pandemic you know the black lives matter movement how is this impacting the industry i mean i said to my colleagues the other day remember when the big news was like simon and schuster going up for sale yeah yeah <laughs> it was a simpler time um i mean the pace of the news cycle has been really hard um there's so I, it's such a it's like where do you even start there's like so many different things you could talk about here um the pandemic piece of it is like better and worse and better and worse than i think any of us could have thought it would be um books are still selling and we're all really worried about like indie bookstores um it's it's weird it's a very cognitively dissonant time because there are still such wonderful wins to celebrate books are still selling we're placing debuts we're having authors break out we're having you know books that despite retail not existing somehow readers are still finding their way to them um but then also you're scared we've had clients who've been sick we've had people we work with who've been sick um you know, within our own personal spheres of friends and family, it, it's really hard. Um, I think it's hard for everybody right now, but, and publishing is no exception, but there have been bright spots and there have been um, like an encouraging resiliency and desire for storytelling. Um, yeah, I mean, does anybody else want to like, am I alone on that island <laughs> where it's like, ah. <laughs> It's a no, lot. I mean, that's, that's really exactly how I feel. It's, it's up yeah. and down every day. You know, business is progressing weirdly normally in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I'm, I'm someone who works from home almost every day anyways. So in that sense, it hasn't felt like a big shift. Um, and, you know, we are selling books. Uh, I don't think, a thing that people, I'm not sure, realize about traditional publishing, though, is that we're very dependent on uh, physical bookstore sales. Um, selling books in stores, selling physical books in stores is hugely important to the industry. So, you know, I think the big question for us is what happens when bookstore sales decline? Um, and thankfully, you know, the, the indie bookstores launched a new tool, uh, Bookshop, uh, right before all this happened. So that's helped a little bit, I think, but it certainly doesn't make up for, you know, people walking in off the street and picking up, you know, that hardcover book on the front of store table. Um, so, and, you know, Barnes and Noble is a big question mark of what's going to happen there. Um, so those are the things I think that tap into our fears, but you know, what Holly's saying is also true that we're selling books, both us selling books to publishers and publishers selling books to, to readers. Um, so it hasn't been as dire as I certainly was feeling in those first few weeks, um, uh, with regard to our industry, at least. Yeah, I, I joke that, um, 
like the responses have slowed down a little bit as everybody's adjusting to working from home, but somehow I'm still super busy. Um, so yes, everything feels very business as usual. I'm still trying to finalize contracts, still sending things out on sub, um, and you know, still having clients debuting. Has, has, um, has, have the events of 2020 changed um, how you look at projects or how you're approaching your job? Or is it still mostly business as usual in terms of, of just pitching to editors and going about your work apart from doing it at, at home? Is, has anything changed in the way you, you receive projects? I don't think we know yet what people, I mean, I don't know yet what I'm, going to like want to read in two years. So that's the other weird thing, right? So um, I sold a project earlier this spring in the sort of like rom com vein um, and editors were like, it felt like a love letter from a long lost age because like people were walking around and touching their faces and kissing strangers. It was very, it's very uh, refreshing. Um, so I think people, like, it's too soon to know yet whether that is going to be something where we're like, oh, remember bars? Or are we going to be like, we want books that reckon with this moment? Um, I mean, I personally have been reading a lot of nonfiction and a lot of SFF in part because it's like, oh, well, that is definitely not right now because I've got plenty of right now. <laughs> Thanks. Um, while still, you know, all the best speculative fiction rec reckons with big issues, right? So it's sort of a little bit of that. So I'm, I'm curious to know if that will end up being something that we see play out more. I don't, I don't feel like I know. I'm just still trying to follow good storytellers where they want to go and let that be determinative. I don't think we can say definitively yet, like, is there a post-pandemic literature <laughs> that, like, will take shape, but. Yeah, I know um, in the beginning of the lockdown, editors were telling me that they wanted kind of fun, fluffy rom-coms um, because everything was just so, like, dark and hard. Um, and even me, I'm, like, super dark and murdery and stabby all the time. And even I was like, I can't read that right now. But it's also starting to shift for me. Like I'm back to reading, you know, my murdery books. Um, and I think, you know, people are starting to come back to their normal, usual taste. I mean, stepping away from uh, the pandemic to other major things that we've been dealing with the past few weeks, you know, with, with the Black Lives Matters and the George Floyd protests and things like that. I'm, I am hoping, given the conversation we've seen in the publishing sphere over the past couple of weeks, that we will see a um, uh, a wave of new black authors and you know editors being aware that they need to really challenge uh, how they acquire books and really think about how they're promoting those books within those houses and not just editors agents too I, I think this applies to to all of us you know sort of top to bottom in the industry um, and you know I'm hoping that this this does inspire some moment of, of lasting change as you know the conversation progresses another step forward here yeah, and publishers love to, well, industry-wide, which I'm not excluding us from this narrative because we're also culpable, love to have an exception and be like, but no. And we've seen this a little bit on the romance side because there's been, um, the Ripped Bodice does a report on diversity in romance every year. And, you know, they're working with the best data they can get. It's not airtight, certainly, but it's a lot better than what we had. And what I've found is that every year people say, no, no, but it's getting better. It's getting better because they've got like one author in their head that they're thinking about, like, but this one author, um, and then the numbers every year just show this incredibly incremental progress. And my hope is that this conversation and um, the sort of like overwhelming data set that's coming out of this moment in time will, make it a lot harder for people to have a Highlander, we fixed it mentality um, and really commit and stay in it. And that's a conversation we've been having at my company um, and that I think a lot of people are having. And it's not, it's certainly not the first time that this conversation has been had in publishing, but it does feel like an inflection point. I hope that we're gonna, there's, there seems to be a team lift in a way that prior, um, conversations maybe were more sequestered within a given category um, or or genre. 
And um, if you're looking at the RIP Autos report on the SFF side, I would also look at the uh, FIA mm -hmm. does a black speculative fiction report every year. That is very helpful and very um, eye-opening to look at the overall picture of the marketplace. So. Sorry, I froze. So <laughs> I had a, a, Zoom, a Zoom moment. I had to make sure um, everyone has uh, had just like stopped talking. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, um, so shifting, did anyone else have anything to add there? Sorry, because I missed the end of that conversation. Well, Lars, do you want to speak to like what the Hollywood version of all this has been? That's what, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry, so, I just didn't want to keep him from out of well, our no, language. No, 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 it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it was a publishing question and I didn't want to, yeah. Um, but, but, okay, so Hollywood, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of answers there. Um, you know, uh, I, I think for me, this has kind of been a, a reminder of that old William Goldman quote that nobody knows anything, right? Like we're trying to predict and and it's very difficult to do you know i had a client uh who was working on a project you know being paid to work on a project um about a disease about a pandemic and he said well i guess there goes my project and but i i had just happened to have seen an article the day before that um the most popular titles on netflix and amazon were outbreak and world war z so i'm like i don't i don't know that that's true right so we're all trying to make predictions about what's going to happen um and and sort of failing um the one thing I can say, but again, this is one of those data points that in a month may not be applicable anymore, but on the, on the movie side, right, and the television side, there is, um, there is a sense that um, what people want to buy are things that are makeable in a post-COVID world, so uh, fewer locations um, inside, uh, you know, not scenes with tons of extras, um, things that are smaller. I think the first movies that are going to go into production, the first TV shows that are going to go back into production are going to be um, smaller scale shows. The Marvel stuff, you know, who knows when that stuff's going to come back, but those are, those are productions that require thousands of people um, involved at all kinds of different levels, and those are going to be hard to mount. So um, it's a good opportunity for the stuff that I do, which is you know horror, which tends to be smaller, um genre stuff in particular i think there's there's a lot of a, uh, there's a big market for always will be but but you know just for now because of the the covid thing um and then and then yeah on the diversity side there continues continues to be a push you know we have a a weekly staffing meeting where we talk about um tv jobs that are available on tv staffing and um you know almost every single listing and there are literally dozens of them maybe even a hundred. Um, it's, you know, Hey, we're primarily focused on women. We're primarily focused on uh, writers of color. So um, there's a huge, there's been a huge push in Hollywood for that for a couple of years now. And, and that, and that will continue, I expect. Um, so I'm, that's a lot of information, but I guess I covered everything. And, and what about the book, the film climate? Is that, is that kind of on hold? Is it, is it something that you also, you guys also have kind of just had to kind of gauge as, as you go along? You know, it's funny. Uh, I was just—I've been saying to a lot of people, just kind of jokingly, because it's—it's it, it, a tough time in Hollywood, and a lot of people are, are worrying about their jobs. And you know, again, don't cry for us. We're Hollywood. We're doing fine. But um, but um, you know, being a writer or representing writers, as I do, is are the two most viable jobs in this town right now. So I feel really lucky. Um, but on the book to film stuff, look, books. It's scary to make a movie, right? It's super scary to make a movie that's not based on anything. So books are still gold in Hollywood. Comic books and, and regular books are still gold. Um, if you've got something that's based on underlying material, that is still the, the best way to get something, get people excited about something in Hollywood, absent a giant attachment, which is really hard to do. But there's a gazillion books out there and a gazillion comic books. And if you can find a great writer with a great take on, one, on a piece of material, there's lots of places to sell that stuff right now. Um, when we can make it, no one really knows. And there's an assumption that we're going to run into a wall where you, you know, look, a train yard, right? Like you got to move some trains out before you move some trains in and we're not moving any trains out. So the concern is there's going to come a moment where people aren't going to be able to pay writers to write movies anymore because there's just too much stuff on the stack, but we haven't hit that point yet. So I'm staying optimistic because that's all we can really do. Yeah, we got One funny thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Holly. Oh, okay. We we got force majeured on a project like where we it's like pause um, yeah. which honestly is like not a bad. It's not bad news. It's there for a reason. Um and hopefully yeah. when it lifts we'll be able to 
kick back up. Um, but I've not, I've had more authors on calls, Zooms, whatever, during this time. Um, I think because everybody in development is like, we're open for business. And yeah, so right. it's very, like, <laughs> uh, which great, you know, fantastic. So book to film has been really robust for us this yeah. during, during the shutdown. Yeah. Same. And I think part of that is, is, you know, actors, directors, showrunners, they're all home right now for once. They're not shooting. So you can actually get them to read a book, which, you know, usually that's a nightmare trying to get a, a book in somebody's hands. But for once, everyone's home and bored. So I'm suddenly, they're like, oh yeah, so-and-so read it over the weekend. And I was like, wait, what? What happened here? Um, yeah. So there is weirdly a nice opportunity for us in the specifically book to film space. But, you know, I do think there is an end to that road if production doesn't start picking up again. Um, and we'll see what happens there. Yeah. Oh, the other weird thing, just to caveat this, animation, because animation is yeah. Oh, yeah. open for business. Yeah. Um, right. And so tons and tons of interest in the younger end of things, things that can be done animated. Yeah, we talk, we talk about um, how, you know, if you guys remember the last writer strike sort of ushered in the, the, the glory days of reality television, if we can call it that. Um, and, and so there's a, because, you know, because reality television spoke to a, hey, we don't need writers, right? So it's cheaper, whatever. Um, so now we're in this world where animation, because you don't have to expose anyone to anything to make an animated series or an animated movie, um, is suddenly valuable again. And I'm hearing weird some, you know, stories about companies that I won't, I'm not going to mention who, but companies that have traditionally done family oriented stuff who are like, Hey, we need to get into other genres. We need to, we need to do animated horror. We need to do R rated, you know, animated comedy. Like there's a huge opportunity. I mean, I don't know if it's going to happen the same way it happened with reality television after the writer strike, but I think there's going to, there could be a golden age of animation coming. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's true. Good, good point, Holly. So books are still selling to publishers. Um, books are still sell selling in Hollywood. Um, new pro new screenwriting projects are still selling in Hollywood. Uh, things are still selling, right? For now, yeah, yeah. But like you know, to, not to go back to the train analogy, but you know, at some point we're gonna have they're gonna have to make stuff um, because they can't just keep they can't just keep spending money on development um, if there's no production. But look, we get, you know, the thing is like studios, um, they don't make anything, right? They're not, they're not, it's not, uh, they're not Ford, right? Like they don't sell trucks. They're a pipeline. And if there's nothing going through the pipeline, these companies cease to exist. So they have to make stuff at some point that, you know, whether it's animation or if it's one actor sitting alone in a room, they got to make, so they got to make something because the pipeline can't sit fallow for long without these gigantic multinational corporations going out of business. And you know, that's just not going to happen. So. And so th taking all this into account, sort of things are still selling things are, are definitely still moving forward. Uncertain future. Uh, what would you tell an author in this, in this phase about how, like, what are you telling your clients in, in terms of how to approach the future, how to approach their projects? Um, what do you, what are you telling your, your clients? I'm saying go big, get weird, write for yourself. Like, I don't know, light it on fire. It's 2020. Who cares? Do whatever makes you happy. Like, it really, like, it, it is, I know that sounds banana pants, but like, that's where I am. <laughs> Just like, no, 100%. That, write the u -iest book you can. Go big. Just keep writing, just keep digging deep, you know? I mean, we're all experiencing a lot of weird feelings right now. And, and I think if you can channel that into your fiction, then, you know, I think that's, that's always a good thing. And that's always going to result in a really exciting book. And, you know, given that we don't know what the hell the world's going to look like in a month, much less at the end of the year, um, you might as well just do the thing that you've always wanted to do and do the thing that's, that's as weird as possible because the world's going to be weird. I think that's the only thing we've learned is that <laughs> there's no way to anticipate how weird it's going to get out there. So, yeah. Um, Sorry, well, was that too dark? No, <laughs> no, no, that sounds like a, actually a great, I think that's very empowering. As, as a writer, I find that very empowering to just, to just you know, give, get, have the blessing to write the thing that really is going to inspire you during this crazy time and for a crazy future. I was just um, laughing about murder hornets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, remember right. those guys? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're just out there waiting for all of us. I know. Well, I'm, I'm indoors, thank you, Holly. You can better watch the <laughs> show over there. Um, well, awesome, guys. This was amazing. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining us in this, uh, in this panel uh, in, in Square Boxes. And I uh, hope you guys all stay safe and uh, 
keep fighting for a better, better world. So thanks guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.